Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're about to get started. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Hello, thank you, Chair Mullen. I have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, scheduling, we have added uh, for next two weeks from today, uh, February 24th, um, our staff is going to give uh, the board an overview of our 2020 annual report, the Green Mountain Care Board annual report. So that um, will, we've put that on the schedule. And a shout out to Sarah Kinsler, not to embarrass you, Sarah, and to Christina McLaughlin, who did a ton of work with the rest of the staff putting that together. It's a great document um, and on our website if folks are interested in looking at that. Um, the second thing I wanted to update uh, members of the public on, and the board knows about this because they were at the meeting, is um, on um, Monday, I always lo lose track of days here, um, Monday afternoon, we had the Green Mountain Care Board General Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, it was a really informative meeting. Um, we heard from our members on what they're dealing with in, in terms of COVID. We heard some really interesting perspectives from them on, on the issues they're still dealing with, obviously. Um, we also heard some advice they had um, to share with um, the, the folks like member Lunge and um, who's running the prescription technical advisory group. So that was helpful. And then the last item um, that we covered with them was we um, gave, we along with uh, the director of healthcare reform at AHS, Ina Bacchus, uh, had a presentation that asked for uh, public engagement um, to inform the potential next agreement with the federal government. Um, so we asked for written comment from an end written advice from our general advisory um, for, for our process at the board to get some uh, public engagement. There obviously are two other signatories on the agreement, the governor as well as um, the secretary of AHS all of the input we hear from our general advisory, we, we will certainly share with the other signatories. Um, but we are also going to, we have two other um, next steps. We are posting that those slides on our, our website and on our um, public comment website. So feel free to check that out and please provide um, any input. Uh, we also next week have invited the director of healthcare reform from AHS to talk with our primary care advisory committee meeting. So that's going to happen next Wednesday evening. Um, so we expect to, you know, re hear more as we move along, and I'm sure um, feedback can given be given directly to uh, the signatories. Uh, of the other signatories on the model. So any questions or comments from the board, so the board members on that update or additions? Great, excellent, thank you. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention is I am going to be scooting off at about two o'clock today from this meeting. Um, we are giving a presentation in house healthcare this afternoon on some of the work that we are doing, our data team is doing. Sarah Lindbergh will be doing most of the presentation on um, adding race and ethnicity data to uh, re requesting um, insurers to provide that data on claims. That will uh, eventually inform uh, a lot of uh, decisions that we make. It also will be uh, and improve the um, health uh, equity uh, role that we can play. It also will, will help tremendously with COVID and um, the vaccine and really studying the impact um, on our community. So that is all I have for today. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, February 3rd. Is there a motion? So moved. So, second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 3, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed aye. signify by saying nay. Motion carries unanimously with the delayed vote. <laughs> Member Holmes. <laughs> um, with that, uh, the next item on the agenda is a discussion of the qualified health plans, the standard plan design. Um, Dana and Addie, did you have a, any um, uh, updates or anything that you wanted to say before we began our discussion? In terms of good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in terms of presentation, I did want to review with the board the um, on exchange enrollment data. Uh, other than that, I didn't have a formal presentation planned for today. It was really returning to respond to questions, comments, etc. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and proceed with that then, Dana? Thank you. As um, mentioned, we are returning as a follow up to last week's presentation of the proposed uh, standard QHP plan design changes. I'm joined by Addie Stremelo from DIVA, our uh, Deputy Commissioner, and our partners from Wakely Consulting, Brittany Phillips and Julie Pepper uh, will be on hand if there are questions that they um, will respond to as well. So uh, thank you for having us. I will share my screen if that's okay and just get into the Bear with me. Here we go. So, first of all, I want to um, clarify that this report is the on exchange enrollment only. The uh, reporting for the full market relies on getting enrollment data from our issuers, which we are still waiting for. Uh, there's value in reviewing this on exchange report. Um, separately, but we will commit to forwarding that um, enrollment between 20 and 21 for the rest of the market as soon as we can, which shouldn't be long. <laughs> we expect to have that shortly. So uh, looking at this again, um, this is a snapshot by enrollment numbers, the actual numbers of um, plans from 2020 to 2021. I want to point out that um, it's combined data for Blue Cross and MVP together. So it's to show that, you know, in this column and this column, the change by number by plan. Also, the plan type is combined if there are more than one, for example, standard bronze plans, those figures are combined. Uh, to give you a snapshot by um, plan type, metal level, and each CSR level. I want to spend the most time on the uh, color chart. The next slide shows those same uh, changes by in terms of a percentage year over year. So I want to turn to this, which is um, reflecting the change from one to the other, first in terms of a percent and then the actual number. Um, I also want to point out that in this row, it's all NA in this reflective uh, row. Just um, to remind everyone that reflective silver plans are only available off exchange directly through the issuer, so uh, they won't be included here. So as I think Addy mentioned last week, we have seen a fairly significant overall decrease in on exchange QHP enrollment. Uh, since last year of 1900 um, <clears throat> that's across all metal levels and we attribute that to uh, we think we're seeing the effects of uh, COVID and the corresponding unemployment change in the state and there is an uptick in Medicaid enrollment likely due to um, you know again the unemployment and and income change for these impacted households. Uh, looking at some of the thing, the kind of significant things in terms of by metal level, um, the biggest decrease is in the silver area. And I think we've seen this before where um, this is, we think, largely due to an impact, the impact of silver loading, which means that um, 
it raises the the options for it makes enrollment more selection more complicated in a way for um, for customers because uh, with the increase in subsidy they there is the option of a zero or very low cost bronze plan which I'll speak to in a minute um, and for some of the CSR levels um, 77 and 73 in fact um, could purchase a gold plan at a higher AV level for a small incremental um, premium difference. And, you know, depending on someone's expected utilization, those choices um, would often be better than staying in a silver plan. How did you get that message out to the public so that people are making informed decisions, Dana? Well, multiple ways. It's certainly a message that's um, uh, focused on with our sisters. A lot of training there, you know, for the one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance um, through that group. It's definitely, um, you know, we're, we're not steering a, an enroll an applicant towards any one plan, but it's uh, a factor that would be illustrated plainly in the uh, plan comparison tool because that's where somebody would answer several questions that would, um, you know, with their anticipated utilization, um, if something else might be um, a good option for them to consider other than a silver plan. And obviously, if, um, if someone is not um, subsidy eligible and is interested in staying in a silver plan, they are strongly encouraged to go to a issue or direct reflective silver plan at a lower cost so kind of through multiple channels it's it's communicated um just want to make sure I'm So I think those are the things that I would really want to draw to your attention um, with this report for the on exchange. And if there are any questions, happy to take them. Addy, is there anything that you would like to add? No, thanks, Dana. Good summary. Okay, board members, do you have any questions for Dana or Addy? Hearing none, does a board member wish to make a motion before I go to public comment? Sure. <clears throat> um, I move that we approve the change in the deductible for the bronze plan without prescription drug limit and approve the change in pediatric vision benefits to align cost sharing across all standard plans and metal levels. And is there a second? Second. Okay, at this time I'll open it up to the public for discussion before we vote. Does any member of the public wish to um, add any input before the vote? Seeing none, um, is there any further discussion by the board? <clears throat> Uh, yes, Kevin, I'd, I'd like to spend a, a couple of minutes here. This, I recognize that this is a very narrow vote on a very small corner of um, one plan. Um, but, I, you know, I, I had some trouble getting, and I'm not even not sure, sure I'm there yet, getting to yes on this. Um, I look at the percentage increases um, in these plans and for the medical deductible silver plan, it's 6.3%. For the gold plan, it's 9.1%. And the platinum plan, it's 14.3%. And this is on top of uh, five-year annual trends for silver, gold, and, and platinum plans, respectively, at 9.65%, 7.1%, .1 and 9.9%. And so I think about that and the people that are, are on the other end of that. And I think about the overall Medicaid cost shift I think about the message that uh, 
went along with the 2021 budget uh, adjustment of level funding uh, Medicaid payments, but for federal mandates. Um, I noticed that the um, <clears throat> the reduction in the QHP premium and CSR subsidies uh, from 7.9 million in 20 in 2018 down to 6.7 million in a proposed 2022. Um, I see little progress on the benchmark plan. Um, and uh, even though five other states have moved forward on this, um, you know, that is a way to align and lower costs through prevention. And I see little progress on the premium cliff. Uh, we did get a study from Wakeley that said we could lower um, the premiums by 10% for those between 400% and 500% um, for a little over 2 million bucks. And I kind of put that $2 million in perspective by seeing, you know, uh, in the overall appropriations for the agency that, uh, you know, $19.6 million was found um, in reductions. 10.7 of that was repurposed, but there was 8.9 million that, you know, that fell to the bottom line. And I also kind of went back and read the executive summary and recommendations uh, having to do with the um, implementation improvement plan for the Vermont All Payer model that was presented to us last November. And there, you know, there's one quote uh, <clears throat> from the findings is that healthcare reform activities at the Agency of Human Services are not clearly organized for success in the agreements. And another one, a recommendation that says organizing healthcare reform activities in the agency of human services to uniformly drive towards the performance domains in the state federal and uh, state federal agreement. So these percentage increases are big. Um, if they were all down around the bronze plan at the three to four percent range, I wouldn't have any problem as I, you know, haven't with uh, insurance rates going up, you know, in the three point five percent range and hospital budgets going up at less than that. But I, I just feel that this is incremental creep. Um, and uh, um, I'll, you know, uh, you know, my preference is to vote no on this. And, and just because I, I, I don't see this um, and think about the people that are facing these percentage increases in their medical deductible and, and really kind of want to put a stake in the ground and say, we, we, we've got to change this. I mean, we've got to do something about uh, the premium cliff. We've got to do something about <clears throat> um, the uh, benchmark plan and uh, and and make progress more progress toward the good here. I fully understand the hard work that goes into this, but I think it's it's too narrow a view. And uh, um, so, those are my comments. Thank you, Tom. Other board members. So what's your alternative, Tom? Well, I don't Are have... Are you saying that you would want to keep the bronze deductible plan the same and the vision, the pediatric vision benefits the same? Uh, I, th those I don't want. I mean, I didn't, when I was reading, uh, you know, looking, looking over my presentation here, I didn't include the bronze deductible because, you know, it's, it's down at the 4.3% range. Uh, in terms of the medical deductible and a 3.6 percent, you know, five-year trend rate, and I can live with that. But it's 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 getting higher than that. Um, um, you know, obviously, I've been in a situation as you have, Robin, where you, where you know how to make things happen inside state government. I'm outside state government now, but I can tell you that, you know, if Howard Dean ever came to me and said, "Tom, can you find two million dollars to?" Uh, uh, um, for uh, some premium subsidies or for help those above 400% to 500%, I could do it. Um, and I, I, I think that the innovation plan, uh, the, uh, the implementation improvement plan says the same thing, is that, uh, uh, you know, all the horses aren't, put, or as Mike, Mike said in his presentation, everybody in the boat isn't rowing in the same direction. So, um, I, I, you know, what I can do is to raise this issue persistently. Um, if someone wants me to come over and find the money, I'd be glad to try to do that. Um, and, uh, but that's not my job anymore. I just know it can be done um, if, if, if the will is there. These aren't big numbers. Two million bucks is not a big number to help those between 400 and 500 percent of poverty. It's not a big number.
other board members. So I don't believe I've heard any amendment, Robin, to your original motion. So I believe that we're um, still on that uh, motion before us. Before I call the vote, is there any further discussion? In not knowing what the outcome will be and knowing the rules for remote voting, Mike Barber, if you could call the roll. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Pelham? No. Member Yusufer? Yes. Uh, Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. So let the record show it was a 4-1 vote. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Addy. Very good. Thank you. You know, we have to uh, remember that uh, the exchange is where people get help with these payments. And without uh, a good solid exchange, a lot of Vermonters would be in a very dark place. So thank you for everything that you're doing. So we're ahead of schedule on the agenda. I'm not sure if Vital has joined us. If not, I would uh, skip to the third item on the agenda. Um, is Vital on? I think we are. we're going to try to get them on. Sarah Kinsler is going to reach out to them. Yep. Sarah? We, uh, we are on. Oh. I, to, I see most of our team. Yep. Great. Are you okay with going, going early? We are happy to. Super. Well, we're Great. glad that you, you're happy to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Beth, you can go ahead and take it away. Great. Um, can, is, can we, we have a member of our team who's going to show slides, so I'm sure they'll appear as I'm talking, but I'll, I'll just get started if that's okay. That's fine. Um, great. Um, so we, you know, we're here for a quarterly update. Um, I thought we'd start just with some quick introductions of who we have here um, or who is joining. I will, I will ask everyone to introduce themselves, but I'll call names so we know those awkward pauses. So I'm Beth Anderson. I'm president and CEO of Vital. Um, I'll just go in order of how people are presenting. Um, so we have Carolyn Stone. If people are still dialing in. Maybe what I'll do is I will give you their names and then they can introduce themselves when they start to talk. So we'll have Carolyn Stone, our operations director. We'll give you an update on our the collaborative services project and our COVID work. Maureen Gilbert, who just popped on, our client engagement director. Sorry, Maureen, I was doing introductions for us. <laughs> Um, Bob Turnell, who I see. Bob, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Bob Turnell here. Okay. We have Christopher Schenk. He is our director of IT. And we also have, not, not talking, but may answer some questions, Frank Harris, our strategic technology advisor. Um, so Good afternoon, just... Everyone. Hi. Great. So we'll get started. Um, Frank, are you able to display the slides or do you want me to do? Yeah, I should be on slide. Great. Everyone see that okay? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks. If you would jump to slide five. Um, what I wanted to do was just get us started was just to give a quick update on um, <clears throat> what we accomplished in CY20, you've heard a lot of it before from us, so we'll just give a very high level. Um, I was gonna do a quick overview of what is in our, our new, our CY21 contract with Diva, which will just set some foundation for you as we go through the rest of the presentation and talk about the collaborative services project and, and certainly the, the update to the FY21 budget that you'll see in, in a few moments. Um, so you see why 20 our work um, we, we started with a plan to spend a lot of time focused on the collaborative services project and the consent right so we successfully implemented phase one of the collaborative services so that included um, moving the 
the Rhapsody, um, putting in a new uh, master patient index, which you've heard us talk about the improvements to patient matching that resulted from that and a new terminology service to help us do better translation of data. Um, we did uh, um, the kickoff and began implementation of phase two, which you'll hear more about in a bit. Um, and that was the really the big piece last, last year was selecting the new platform to replace our infrastructure and began implementation of that. Um, we managed to transition to an opt-out consent model in March. It sounds, seems like it was much longer than a year ago, um, but we successfully translate, transferred um, to the new model and did, I think, a pretty robust patient education program, which will continue. Um, what was not on our list at the beginning of the year was obviously the work we've done with VDH and in support of providers around COVID. Um, and so this, just to give you a sense, you've heard about a lot of the work from us, but just to give you some numbers to the work, um, in addition to providing the daily hospitalization report for VDH, which um, saves them a lot of manual data collection from the hospitals, we signed up or it built interfaces to 12 new locations to get COVID testing results, that included the state lab, um, uh, as well as some of the testing sites, um, 53 new locations for immunizations, and that number will continue currently, it will continue to grow. We have a lot in the pipeline as the immunization program rolls out. Um, and we onboarded 19 EMS agencies to use vital access so they have critical patient data as they're going to respond to emergencies and transport patients. We worked with UVM through the cyber attack. Um, Maureen worked very closely with stakeholders to begin discussions around what sharing of sensitive and mental health treatment data might look like if we were to collect it into the VHI. Um, we did some work with OCV to expand their patient populations and improve their reporting, and we made many security upgrades to our platform. Um, Frank, if, next slide, please. Turning to the new contract, which we signed with Diva at the end of December, um, the value of the contract is just over $9 million. Um, that includes our maintenance and security, you know, the kind of keeping the lights on work for the VHI as well as then development projects of about 5.6 million. It also includes a task order of $400,000, which is undefined work, but leaves us some room to identify new work during the year, as we found last year in our work with um, public health, new things came up that we hadn't anticipated in the year and will allow us some room to expand that project work. Um, next slide, please. The development work, um, breaks down into a couple of buckets. A big piece of it is around the new data platform, completing the implementation of the new, the new MedicaSoft platform. We'll be delivering the blueprint extracts to them. Um, it's transitioning of interfaces onto the new platform, making sure we are aligned to and can meet the new information blocking rules and the interoperability rules that are going into place making sure consent happens effectively, and then also looking at ingesting new data types. And what that will look like for 21 is, our goal will be to ingest Medicaid claims data. So we'll be working with the Medicaid team to actually begin collecting their claims and helping um, figure out how to get them more value from combining the data together. We'll also be developing requirements for sensitive data and social determinants of health with the intent of really this year being about stakeholder engagement, understanding what people would want, how the data could be used, with the goal of then collecting that data in a future year. Um, another 2.6, almost $2.7 million will be around data access and public health. So continuing our work with BDH, again, delivering the daily reporting, um, onboarding new entities for immunizations. We've been working with them on a lot of um, data kind of requests and provision of data for them as they help to think about and plan the immunization rollout. And we'll continue, we'll continue that work. Um, we will continue working with providers to expand data collection and access. So getting data in, new data in, making sure everyone who wants access to our data has access to the data. Um, we will launch a new provider portal, which we believe will be really great. Um, we'll provide some much more usability for providers who have the provider portal and get more data to them at the point of care. We'll continue the meaningful use and security risk assessment consulting. That will be expanded a bit this year to also do some consulting around the interoperability rules to make sure providers are aware of how the rules impact them and that they're ready to meet them. Um, continue some work on emergency response. Our data quality work is gonna shift. So whereas traditionally that's been around work with the Blueprint team and their providers, we're going to now partner with um, Bi-State to look at the, their data quality models and work that they do with the FQHCs 
and look at ways of expanding their models to more providers across the state. We, you know, in talking with them and work with Diva, we feel like they have a really robust model that could benefit others. And we want to look into doing that. Um, also continue work started last year around data governance. Next slide, please. Um, we'll also have projects this year happening that you'll, you'll see in the budget that are um, not necessarily supported directly by the, the contract, but we're underway in strategic planning. We're looking at building our sustainability model and thinking about how we how our work is supported going forward. Um, we will be doing more robust kind of stakeholder engagement and storytelling. Um, so really, and this is kind of what we brought Maureen on, um, you, you've heard me say before, is really to do a better job of talking about what the VHI does and how we can help um, and also kind of reaching out to our stakeholders and the providers across the state and understanding what would be valuable to them and how can we meet their needs. We want to make sure that as we that we're truly adding value and truly helping them solve their challenges and not just giving them tools that we think are useful. Um, we will continue our work with OneCare. We did sign a new contract for 2021 with them. And um, we will continue our work to meet the interoperability rules and also working with hospitals to um, make sure that they are meeting the, the new requirements, particularly around the new conditions of participation requirements. So with that, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Carolyn to give you an update on operations. Are there any questions for Beth? Um. Yes, Maureen. I just had one on, you know, did you have any learnings from what's going on with, with COVID and with the cyber attack and, and A, either how prepared you guys were to be able to help with that or maybe some gaps that you learned from that? Yeah, um, I'll give some quick answers. I think the cyber attack is an easy one to answer. Um, we need to and we are, we are actively working to better communicate with providers to make sure that we are all um, prepared, right? I think one lesson we learned is we didn't have all of the providers set up with user accounts to vital access to the provider portal. So we, you know, it was a big scramble to get new accounts set up so people could access the data. Something we might be able to think about doing ahead of time. So should somebody face an issue, they're ready to go. Um, so I think there are things like that we can absolutely look at and, and work towards. Um, and we are, UVM has been a great partner and they're helping us kind of think through how we on both ends can learn from that and kind of expand that knowledge to others. Um, I would say from COVID, I, I, you know, it's hard to say, like, I think we're, we're probably excited about our new data platform and the way that that will help us to meet needs like this more e efficiently. Um, so, so the collaborative services project will show its value. I, I, you know, I think from lessons and somebody else on the team may have something else to add, but I, I think we were, we were, able to pretty quickly partner um, with VDH and they've been good partners and working with us to figure out what they need um, and try to kind of address those needs. You know, we, I think one piece that we, we are finding now that we are, we are working through um, is their ability to share data back with us is pretty limited right now. And I think, so that's a challenge. So for us to be able to provide, provide for providers, um, a, a, holistic view of their patients is a challenge and an example and one that we're working through is the immunization registry. The statute right now doesn't allow them to share that data with the HIE. Um, it's, there, there's um, current language in the, the bill the Senate is drafting to change that, but that's a problem because we will only have the immunizations that are submitted to us that we provide to VDH, but they can't give us back if any have come directly to them, not through the VHI. So, you know, that's an example of something we, we definitely did identify a gap, but we are working to address so we can have more robust, complete data. Good, thank you. Any other questions for Beth? Thank you, Beth. Uh, I, I think you said Carol was next. Yeah. Hi, um, Carolyn Stone from Vital. And I'm going to give you some updates on um, both our collaborative services and some of the work we've been doing, the ongoing work we've been doing to support COVID throughout the state. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So collaborative services, I uh, wanted to get you an update on, on this project as it is such a critical project for us. Um, and this is the second phase. Um, we did pro uh, publish an updated project schedule in December which kind of adjusted for the delays we had um, encountered with the project. 
um, due to you know numerous other things, including COVID pulling pulling some uh, key resources away. Um, but this is going to allow us to meet our deliverables on time. So right now, we're looking at delivering the first uh, blueprint clinical data extract to them in mid-April, uh, or potential earlier if it gets done. Um, the first Medicaid claims file ingested. This will only be Medicaid coming from um, the DIVA program. And um, we're going to adjust that into production in July. We're targeting our provider portal to be live in July as well. And uh, we're working with One Care Vermont on their reporting for later in 2021. Um, you know, to help accelerate, we did bring in some contractors uh, with expertise in the new standard uh, fast healthcare interoperability resources that our database is built on um, to help accelerate that work. Next slide. Um, right now we're finishing testing up the clinical data repository and resolving issues. Um, we're going to complete the terminology code mapping for the blueprint extract and continue validating and testing that our reporting database and the new data model uh, are, are performing as we expect. And um, we're gonna complete the integration of terminology services, which is one of those phase one uh, items that we already implemented. It's a, it's a separate module and we're just gonna integrate it into this new platform. Um, on COVID, um, we've been doing a lot of work. We're doing our daily hospitalization report to VDH. Um, and then this also ends up supporting the reporting for Vermont to the US Health and Human Services Agency. Um, we continue to do ad hoc reporting uh, as needed to support their planning efforts. Um, and the provider portal is, continues to be used by the epidemiology team um, to support their case investigations. And we are onboarding uh, emergency medical services teams across Vermont to help them with uh, getting the data on patients they're treating and transporting for COVID and um, some of the other aspects that we're doing is we're continuing to build interfaces uh, for commercial testing laboratories and pharmacies um, to the immunization registry. Uh, we've got a lot of new interfaces coming on online, uh, with both live and in progress. Um, we've built a couple of new types of interfaces to convert text file data to the standardized HL7 format that uh, the Department of Health expects um, to support sources that can't produce these standard formatted messages. Um, so that was a, a new piece of work that we're proud of. Um, and that's my update on those two areas. Does anyone have any questions for me? Questions for Carolyn from the board? Yeah, I just have one on the collaborative services, and I know that's where potentially there was annual savings, both for vital in the state and also cost avoidance. And just with any of the delays, how is this being impacted, or when do you see those coming into play? Carolyn, do you want? Um, I think Bob best can speak to those questions. Yeah, I, I can answer some. Yeah, I'll start and Bob can help me. Uh, you know, when it came to some of the savings, I think the most significant pieces of the savings won't be impacted. And that was largely with the, the, the work around the blueprint extract, which we are still delivering on time for them to be able to get this year. So fortunately, that was not largely impacted. There may be some smaller amounts that were on some software contracts that we had that may extend um, a little bit longer. But, you know, when we talked about that, that bigger number, and I, I, gosh, it was over $1 million. I remember the exact number. But, you know, the, the biggest piece of that was really in the, in the early phases was the blueprint on that. That should, that should not be a problem. Okay, thanks. Bob, would you? No, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, certainly, um, any of the delay, and I'll speak to that in another chart, um, is just going to move things to the right a little bit. I mean, we're, we're still gonna pay subscription fees for uh, once we go live and instead of 
being in December, it's now in April. So there's a slight difference, um, and that's represented in the forecast. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Carolyn? Yeah, I have one quick one. Um, I think Go it's ahead, on Tom. slide. I think it's on slide twi twelve now. Um, but uh, you say that you're onboarding EMS teams across Vermont, um, and you is it on slide twelve? Uh, anyhow, it, it's so. You know, it's the slide that references, um, there it is right here, yep. uh, Vital Continues to Onboard EMS Teams. Um, so, uh, but if you can put some metrics to that, how many teams have you onboarded and how many are there to on onboard? Um, we have, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, uh, but I can so certainly I'm, look these up. The end of, <laughs> as of the end of last, as of the end of December, we had onboarded 19 of them. Yeah. Um, there are, Maureen, you can check me on this, there are over 200 um, of, as you can imagine, very varying sizes and focus yep. across the state. That's right. Thank and we're you. partnering with um, emergency services at the state to um, learn more about how they want to um, help support this. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, we'll proceed. All right, so client engagement update. That's me, Maureen Gilbert um, from Vital. And I'm actually gonna have you jump right to the next slide, please, Frank, because this is our, our annual report, which we submitted uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, it's a report that we are required to submit each year to the to you, to the Green Mountain Care Board, also to the legislature, and to secretaries and uh, commissioners and deputy commissioners at the state reporting on our activities for, for the year. And um, there's a link here. It's a live link in, in the document that we sent you and would really uh, encourage you to, to take a look. Um, it summarizes a lot of what Beth was was offering um, early in this meeting. So a um, little bit about what we did this year, a lot about what we did this year, and then a little bit about what's coming up in 2021. Next slide, please, Frank. I'm also going to be really brief on the consent update, just letting you know that our opt-out rate remains steady, and we've got um, a chart about that later in the presentation and that we are planning more provider and patient education to begin in, in March. So next month we'll be putting some renewed focus on provider and patient education. Next slide, please, Frank. Thank you. So I'm going to provide a little bit more detail here today on our sensitive data sharing project. And this is the project to explore the consent model for sharing substance use disorder treatment data and other sensitive data, um, including mental health treatment data through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. So this is happening in two phases. One is designing policies and procedures, and this is really well underway. Um, we have engaged an advisory group, multi-stakeholder, um, multi-organization advisory group, and we are doing focus groups and interviews that include representation from independent practices, hospitals, federally qualified health centers, designated agencies, and provider associations. We're also recruiting for additional stakeholder engagement right now and thinking about um, how to include patients in, in this work and make sure that, that their voice is, is a part of this. Towards the end of 2020, we um, did a lot of work documenting the business requirements, the solution design, and the policies and procedures that we in, envision here. And we're currently waiting with bated breath for implementation guidance around how the CARES Act is going to change 42 CFR part two. The, um, what, we're, what we're expecting here is that this change could allow part two data to flow just as if it's HIPAA data with no additional restrictions, which would be a real game changer in the accessibility of this data. Um, but, but there are a lot of details still to be worked out. We're anticipating those to come from the federal government in March. Phase two is the pilot, and this is really an implementation pilot. We're not 
not so much a pilot. We're not testing the policy so much as how we implement the policy, how we educate about the policy, the consent model that we will select with stakeholders this year. And so the um, pilot planning is happening in late 2021, um, working with a designated agency, a federally qualified health center and a specialty treatment center looking to actually turn that pilot on and start the data flowing more in 2022 when we would be iterating with um, feedback from provider staff and patients on, on the education approaches and the workflows within those settings. So again, I want to just say that that pilot planning is late 2021, but we're looking at actually turning the data on um, in 2022. Of course, some of this dependent on um, the the work we plan out with the state for 2022. And that's all from me. Any questions? Yeah, Maureen, this is Robin. I had a question um, about what kinds of qualitative uh, information you're you're learning through your preliminary focus groups and engagement with on the provider sector. And that's one question. The other is um, when would you expect to start engaging with the patient patients and hearing patient issues or concerns or feedback? Sure. Um, so I will jump in very carefully to the first question because it, it has not been extensive engagement so far, but I think we're hearing some things that that we, we can tell you um, about that I expect to hold true. We'll certainly test them. One is that the consent model that we select has to be absolutely reliable. So if we're going to say um, this kind of data will, will be available or this won't, or you can make a choice about X or Y, we have to absolutely be able to deliver that. Um, and, and so that sort of reliability and um, kind of precision is really important. Um, the other thing is really about burden on the organizations and what organizations are going to be willing to, to take on in terms of additional consent management and, and some real concerns about the prospect of taking on um, additional work there. Although certainly, especially in um, mental health treatment organizations, there is a, a long history of, of talking um, closely with patients about um, consent and information flow. So just some concern, but um, also some, some interest in engaging there. Um, so the second question about when to engage patients, we are both like really committed to this, but also entering it um, carefully. And I'm thinking that will be um, early summer of this year. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Maureen? Okay, thank you. Um, then I'll go ahead. This is Bob Trineau from VITAL. Um, good afternoon. Um, I will be going over VITAL's updated forecast of the FY21 budget. Uh, this is the budget that was approved last uh, July by the Green Mountain Care Board. The update, um, the updated forecast includes um, inputs based on actual revenue expenses to date, along with um, our estimate of deliverables for the new um, CY21 contract that Beth talked about, and also our projections of in-flight um, work. Next slide, please. There are four major assumptions associated with this forecast. The first is the completion of the new data platform according to our project plan by April 2021. The next is that um, the development projects inherent within the CY21 contract are to be completed by September 30th, uh, 2021 in accordance with the expiration of the High Tech Act. Um, also, there's the addition of consulting and contract labor to support vital staff to perform the additional scope of development projects and the public health work in the new contract. And finally, um, we've decreased the revenue contingency embedded in our revenue forecast to reflect what we've learned. While we are more confident in our future, we recognize that we are still in the grips of the pandemic and this could adversely affect our forecast. 
Next slide, please. In our forecast, we see three major risks. The need for consulting um, and contracting labor with specialized skills in um, areas such as fire, which uh, Carolyn talked about, could exceed the marketplace capacity, which could impact our ability to complete our deliverables. Two, we are also continuing to learn lessons in the implementation of the new data platform, which in could impact the work scope of this project. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, we still see the pandemic as a potential risk with unknown impacts to our financials. Next slide, please. With this chart, I'd like to add some context with regards to the state funding VITAL has received and our new CY21 contract. There are four calendar years that are shown, um, but please note that CY18 represents an, an estimate since our first calendar year contract was received in CY19. The blue blocks represent development projects and the green blocks represent um, operation funding. Generally, the growth has occurred in our development projects in which the state has invested in vital to implement and deploy uh, projects such as the collaborative services projects along with the new data platform. As Beth has mentioned, the new contract continues the development in these areas um, such as ingesting new data types, data access, access and public health. Also, you'll notice that the increase between the estimate that we used in the FY21 budget and now in the FY21 mid-year budget is roughly 1.9 million. That is, um, you can probably barely make it out, is the $1,865,000 increase. As Beth also mentioned, the blocks of by state and and also the task orders really represent um, funds which we don't anticipate um, passing through vital right now certainly the by state work is a a pass through subcontract and as beth mentioned the task orders are for yet undefined work so in terms of the fy21 contract um, the task orders have not been incorporated into that estimate, but a portion of the bi-state work has. Next slide, please. This slide is a more comprehensive comparison between the CY21 and CY20 contracts. I won't spend um, very much time on it if there are any questions. Uh, please feel free to, to ask them. If not, we can move on to the next slide. This chart summarizes the changes between the FY21 and FY21 forecast of $1.7 million for revenue. The three major drivers here are the new contract, as I just previously mentioned, is larger and that adds almost a half a million dollars of revenue to FY21. Secondly, the state was able to repurpose funds to cover our COVID-related work. This added $826,000, although it didn't cover the entire amount that we had estimated for the year, so that's why you see a negative 56,000 above it. Third, We've revised our estimate of the impact of the pandemic on our revenue. Um, we have decreased the contingency from 6% of total revenue to 1%, and this adds about $400,000 of revenue back into the estimate. Next slide, please. This chart is an update to the one that was included in the FY21 budget review and it's been updated for the changes uh, of the new contract and our new estimate for CY20 work. The intent of this chart was to display revenue by contract and whether those contracts had been awarded. I see that 
awarded contracts indicate a more solid estimating base by removing the risk of how much that contract will be funded for. And as you can see, the only item really left is uh, the revenue contingency line. Next slide, please. The FY21 mid-year forecast projects that expenses will increase by 1.6 million. The major points are the addition of consulting and contract labor and temp labor to augment staff and help support deliverables. And in addition, backfill staff that have been focused on our COVID work. We have, all, we have added several temporary positions in the forecast and you can see this um, on the line called labor cost temporary, and that adds 177,000. In addition, um, we have added $1.2 million of contracting and consulting labor, and I will show that in a, a separate chart below. We have also added additional spending on data security to reflect our continued assessment and enhancement of our system security. Our projection for software costs have decreased due to the timing of the go live of the basic system. Originally, this was estimated to be in December. Now it's projected in April and we don't pay the vendor until the system goes live. We have also added additional spending on more comprehensive training for skills necessary for the new data platform, such as um, fire skills. Next slide, please. This chart is an update of what was presented in the FY21 budget review. The intent is to provide a perspective on the relative amount of the various components of vital expense projection. Next slide. This slide is a update to our org chart that we presented in the FY21 budget review. It reflects our current organization. Next slide, please. Thank you. As I previously mentioned, VITAL's FY21 mid-year forecast contains additional positions to support the new contracted work scope in the CY21 contract. Specifically, the forecast adds 3.4 temporary positions, a subcontract program manager, a part-time medical coder, a full-time application systems analyst, and some additional administrative support. In addition, the core staffing increase is the, the extension of the tenure of our beloved strategic technical advisor. Next slide. This chart summarizes the change in the estimate for the contracting um, labor consulting line item between the original projection and the FY21 budget with the new mid-year forecast. It highlights the major differences between the two estimates. Principally, these are the increase of almost a half a million dollars to support data validation and testing on the new data platform. This in some way backfills vital staff that were engaged in COVID work efforts. The next major portion is the Bi-State um, Vermont Rural Health Alliance initiative on data quality. This is the portion shown is 190,000 and that is part of it um, that is applicable to the FY21 contract, I mean to the FY21 forecast. Next, there is additional forecasted support for uh, the CY21 work scope. These are um, items such as the provider portal and claims data and vital direct work scope, which are part of the CY21 contract. And then the, the next largest piece is additional support 
in terms of data mapping and technical writing for the operations team. Next slide, please. I will close my discussions of VITAL's FY21 mid-year forecast with a chart that summarizes the asset side of the balance sheet. We believe that at the end of the year, VITAL will remain with sufficient financial resources with 137 days of cash on hand to continue our work on projects which benefit the health care of Vermonters. And that concludes my uh, presentation today. Thank you, Bob. Are there questions for Bob? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, Go ahead, easy ones, easy ones, I think. Um, so going to the previous slide, slide 29. So the difference between uh, those two bolded numbers is the $1.229 million. Yes, and, yes. And um, in the narrative you have here, there's no mention explicitly of COVID in the narrative associated with that same number in the um, forecast document that, that we haven't seen here, but came with your materials, uh, the issue of backfilling for COVID by consultants was mentioned. And I'm just wondering uh, how, what are those proportions uh, in, in the one point 229 million and as we roll out into 2022 um, and assuming the world gets better relative to COVID is some of what we're looking at in 2021 uh, one-time expenditure. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would say that um, what we're what we saw was that um, the work on the implementation of the new data platform um, was impacted by the COVID um, relief efforts. I, I, I don't have precise numbers on, um, you know, what that, um, you know, that proportionality is. Um, I don't think it's one to one, um, certainly because as we got into the implementation, um, we certainly saw that the breadth and depth of the data testing and validation effort was um, more than we had anticipated. Okay. Um, Okay. Just to put a little more specificity, if that's okay, I, I think Bob is spot on. You know, the the line items on this this page, though, that you're looking at, that where you see those costs. Um, and Bob, correct me if I don't get this right. Uh, but under the data testing and validation, that four hundred seventy five thousand dollars, a big portion of that is due to the COVID impacts. But Bob's absolutely right. Some of that was we decided we needed some more expertise that we didn't have, and some of it was backfilling. A good portion of it was backfilling the staff, and then a piece of the. Um, the data mapping work also, I think, was falls in that, um, and probably sprinkled among the others. But those are probably the two, the two bigger buckets where you'll see that impact. Okay, and another uh, question um, is: There's no slide that I saw associated with it, but on your balance sheet, you had um, <clears throat> a values for unbilled accounts receivables. And those were growing from 290,000 in fiscal year 2020 to um, the fiscal 21 budget at 668,000, and the fiscal 21 forecast at seven 779,000. And I'm just not clear what an unbilled accounts receivable is. That is where we have uh, performed the work, um, and we have gotten the acceptance of that work by the state, but we may not have actually physically sent an invoice to the customer. And the difference there is, is just in timing and timing of um, when that acceptance happens and also the magnitude of those deliverables at year end. 
Okay, thank you for that. Are there other questions of Bob? I have one on this chart as well. Um, you know, I, I understand the balance between going from consulting to hiring, whether it's temporary or permanent staff and, and the availability kind of in, in each area. Could you estimate though what the upcharge is to use consultants, do you think? I mean, because it's a pretty big consulting number and a pretty big increase of a million two, uh, which typically a consultant is gonna cost you more than it would if you hired someone uh, knowing though there's a balance of would you be able to keep them on so just just wondering what you're what you're thinking there and if you're going to hire more people if you it, would you hire more people if you could i guess uh, um, to offset the consultants and what the upcharge rate of the consultants is i think what Bob, do you want me to you take wanna... some of that yeah. Some of that at least, yeah. I, I from the hiring, I mean, it's a it's a great point that we we keep discussing. A lot of what you're seeing in consulting this year is one time need. I mean, you saw even with our contract, the the portion that's development work was so is what's what's been growing, and we don't expect that to continue. So you know, part of the reason the decision for the consulting is we don't we will not have need for that level of staffing going forward, and certainly don't want to set weird or bad expectations. Also, skills that we don't necessarily have on staff. We will need to hire, and we are absolutely looking at that right now, and we're kind of doing an evaluation as we implement the new platform. What that need is, it's changing some of what our needs would be under the existing platform, and we're we're, we're trying to figure out the the balance of that and what that looks like. In, in terms of the, you know, the multiplier or, or the, the proportion, that's a tough one because, you know, when, when you look at someone's salary, it doesn't necessarily include, you know, fringe and, and you know, the application of overhead and so forth. Yeah, I would assume all in. So, you know, comparing an, a consultant who may be $120, you know, that's an all in with with their markup on it as well, um, compared to, um, you know, staff who, um, you know, are are in, you know, the, you know, the the ninety to ninety five thousand dollar range. I mean, you have you would have to add in you know, our fringe and our overhead um, as well. And I, I think the big thing to consider here is, and I think it's a point that Beth made, is that, um, and I was trying to emphasize with the uh, chart on the state funding, is the peak here um, in that we anticipate that um, going forward that our funding over time is going to be much more, um, much lower than it is today as, as we work to digest these pro projects. And, um, you know, you have the trade-off when you bring in someone um, of having them, you know, investing in them over a period of time to, to gain the skills and experiences to be able to support what we're doing and and really we need skilled people now and in some cases we have to go out and get them because we have you know a really short window uh to complete our work I hope if you'd answers. like oh i mean we can certainly do a more careful comparison just a quick i think a quick blush is um we we have consultants that are certainly on par or close to what we probably are paying all in for staff. And that, that's a, a, a bunch of the consultants. We do have some that we do pay more for, because we're, particularly where we had those that need for really specialty skills, like, you know, moving to this platform that's fire based to get someone who really has true fire skills is hard and expensive. Um, and so we're paying more of a premium for them because of the scarcity, but, but would be happy to provide more detail if that would be useful. Yeah, that's okay. I'm just making, you know, just something to look at. And uh, usually consultants would be a bit more, more than a uh, yeah. person. Even yeah. I would always add all the benefits in as well. I agree with you there. It has to be salary plus benefits. But 
um, if you can get consultants at the same rate, then that, that is a better way to go because you don't have to keep them on the payroll. But um, but to the extent that that's not the case, you know, trying to figure out where you can make offsets. But you know, I understand the specialized need and the short term. You know, that would go against that. So that that's okay. You don't need to follow up anymore. Then thank okay. you. Thank you. Great. Are there other questions for Bob or others on the financials? If not, we'll proceed to the next section. All right. Good afternoon. Thanks, Bob. So since we shared an update um, over the summer, there's been an increase in threats to the healthcare industry, as we all know. Uh, and so we have responded with further advancement of our security program. And I'm I share some of that with you today. Keeping one step ahead of these threats requires a multi-layered approach to security. Since that last update over the summer, um, we've made some, some significant improvements to multiple layers. Uh, in our security program and documentation, we completed our annual penetration test and revised our incident response plan. Um, Medicasoft, Vital's new data platform uh, vendor, they received a high trust security certification, um, which is a comprehensive national security standard for the healthcare industry. For employee access protections, uh, we strengthened our password requirements significantly uh, and improved remote access security and redundancy. We enhanced our network and infrastructure security by increasing restrictions for internet traffic to our network uh, by implementing next gen um, endpoint protection. Um, and next-gen uh, firewalls as well. And, and finally, we're responding to uh, the changes in the threat landscape through the deployment of anti-phishing and anti-spam technologies um, and by requiring multi-factor authentication on, on all server logins. Um, as Vital's commitment uh, to security continues, as will my regular updates on our progress. Um, are there any questions anyone has about our security program? Questions, anyone? We'll proceed. Thank you. Um, and now I'll hand it back to Maureen for our quarterly update. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to provide you with some of the, the facts and figures about the work that we've been doing recently, as you're accustomed to seeing um, each time we present. This is the um, percent of Vermont patients who have opted out of the VHI. As I mentioned earlier, this has remained steady over the year. Next slide, please, Frank. This is our vital access queries by organization type. So you can see how um, those, those searches in our provider portal are distributed across the organizations we serve. And the next slide will show you the overall volume over the course of the year. So this is um, vital access queries month to month, and I think it tells a, a pretty clear story right here of um, what the year looked like and that big, big jump in November as we supported the um, UVM Medical Center's information needs during the cyber attack and also the, the needs of um, neighboring hospitals who, who needed to get at the same patient data. Next slide, please. This next one is queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange via eHealth Exchange, so the national network. Um, these queries come from the University of Vermont Medical Center and the Vet Veterans Affairs and Department of Defense. Um, VA and DOD especially, really strong users of that functionality, especially after launching their Joint Health Information Exchange earlier in the year. We see them um, querying daily, sort of just part of their routine workflow, pulling information about their patients through eHealth Exchange, including from the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Next slide, please. This is our results delivery, where we deliver laboratory results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports directly into the electronic health records of 568 providers around the state. And you'll see that results volume um, relatively steady across the year, of course, with a dip during that time um, in early COVID when, when folks were um, 
utilizing the healthcare system a, a little bit less. Next slide, please. And this is how that results delivery is distributed across organizations. So you can see here that our federally qualified health centers are relying especially heavily on results delivery directly into their um, medical records and that we also have uh, quite a number of independent practices use, utilizing that service. Next slide, please. And this is um, the last slide in this set of charts. Carolyn will have um, uh, another piece of information to share with you next, but this is our meaningful use and security risk assessment consultation that we provide to practices around the state. And you'll just see the hours from one month to the next, as well as the number of locations that we've provided this service to. Any questions about any of these charts before I hand off to Carolyn? Any questions for Maureen? If not, Carolyn, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so just wanted to give an end of the year update on the interfaces and our connectivity criteria. Um, you know, our contracted target was 85 interfaces and um, you know, due to some of the COVID work, we actually completed 143 newer replacement interfaces in 2020. So um, lots of work there to support COVID. Um, we also worked to update the connectivity criteria last year um, to uh, include the mental and behavioral health data components, um, which we brought before you in November for approval with the state HIT plan. Um, you know, and, and our plans are to continue supporting both the organizations and the Department of Health, uh, DIVA and Agency of Digital Services throughout this year to support their, you know, their ongoing needs with COVID as well. Um, that's been a real key piece, I think, that we've heard lots and lots of appreciation for um, being able to provide the data that people need. So with that, I think we are done unless people have questions for us. Okay, are there questions from the board? <laughs> I just. I, I have just one question on the, uh, the access queries. I mean, going from a uh, a number of uh, 9,762 in a month to 87,000 just seems like a huge, huge leap uh, driven by the UVM cyber attack. And is I'm just wondering from being inside your shoes, what was that experience like? Is it as dramatic as it looks on a chart? Or is it, uh, um, you know, or is it just routine and the computers kind of take care of themselves? I can take. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, I think the setting up of the 1,500 plus users in a matter of a week or two definitely was felt internally. Um, once the users are set up and we've provided the training and, and gotten them oriented, then the beautiful thing about the system is that the users can, we can support those volumes of queries without much additional effort. So, um, you know, it was the work and the scrambling involved working to get everyone set up. And that speaks to what Beth was talking about, where we're, you know, we're going to be working with the organizations to see, does this fit in as part of their disaster recovery plan in any way? And what can we do to kind of front load some of that stuff um, so that we're not caught flat footed? I mean, hopefully it happens to no one else in Vermont, but um, it is an emerging threat, unfortunately. Other questions? Sarah Kinsler, do you have any questions from staff or any comments? I don't. I just want to thank Vital very much for um, hopping on the call a little bit earlier than they'd planned and for um, for their kind of collaboration and cooperation and providing us, uh, I think, some, some extensive materials to help us understand their budget. Um, one thing that I do want to note for board members is that um, staff are planning on working with Vital uh, and staff at the Agency of Human Services to um, uh, 
memorialize, I guess, or codify the the vital budget process as as we've done it the past few years and set some more formal guidance. Um, so that's something that the board can look forward to in the spring. Thank you, Sarah. So at this time, I'm going to open it up to uh, public comment or questions for vital. Um, and I see that uh, Mort Wasserman has his hand raised. Mort? Hi, I have a quick question for Carolyn Stone and then a, a question comment uh, for the larger group. The question for you, Carolyn, is you referred quickly to the need for consultants to help with converting data, text data that couldn't be entered or uploaded in HL seven format I, I didn't really understand that i was just curious what that was so the data that we're converting we're actually not using consultants to do that piece um, yeah. but we are taking um, both immunization and covid test data what we've found is there's a lot of e emr vendors in the case of uh, immunizations um, pharmacy chains things like or even some of the hospitals that their vendors are struggling to produce the standard um, health level seven or HL seven message format that's been around for 20 plus years. And so we're able to take the text file and say, you know, take, take each field of the text file and put it into the appropriate place in the standardized message format, and then be able to send standardized messages formats to the Department of Health. Um, and we found the same with the COVID testing labs that have popped up all across the nation to help with testing in the pandemic. A lot of them are genetics companies that happen to want to get into the COVID testing game. And um, they, they don't usually play in this world. Um, so they don't have systems that can produce standardized message formats. But almost everyone can do a flat file, which is really a a glorified Excel document. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. So the other question, or it's a comment, I'm not sure, has to do with the consent management issue and it, that Maureen Gilbert touched upon was mentioned elsewhere. Um, a long time ago, the, it, out of the good, good, good uh, intentions, consent for just participating in the health information exchange was opt in rather than opt out. And that made it relatively useless for a long time. Uh, that has been corrected. The issue of consent regarding mental health and substance abuse disorder stuff is so important. Those uh, two categories of, of um, problems have been stigmatized for so long and we're working on unstigmatizing them. The the uh, getting consent is a very nuanced process. I've dealt with it as a clinician, getting consents for treatment, uh, getting uh, consent for research, which turns out to be way harder than getting sent consent for treatment getting consent for testing. At one time, we had to get consent to do HIV testing. Uh, that's almost gone now, but it really put us behind the eight ball in terms of actually addressing a, a critical public health problem. And now we're uh, at the consent for sharing information. So I'm just hoping you are spending wisely and uh, adequately with consultants about this because you could easily scare the the dickens out of folks with substance use disorder or mental health problems and prevent both clinicians from knowing about these things when they really need to and prevent uh, with respect to social determinants of health prevent uh, state policy uh, makers from knowing what they need to know about the state's patients so i guess that's a blithering comment rather than a question i'd like any more <laughs> information you have on what you're doing. So thank you so much, Dr. Wasserman, for, for those thoughts. Um, we are, are absolutely thinking along those lines and thinking about how what we 
put in place um, collectively because this is a collaborative project and, and we really are um, working closely with our advisory group to to develop this solution and the stakeholders really thinking about how what we put in place now um, is going to look five years, 10 years down the road and really taking a, a long term approach to this. Um, so we will absolutely keep those thoughts in mind. And I think it's really important that we hear from um, physicians and physician leaders like yourself about um, their experience with consent um, and, and with accessing data. And that's why we are bringing providers into this process. Um, so I think Thank you, and absolutely, we will keep those things in mind. Okay, other public comment? Other public comment? I see Rick Dooley's hand. Yeah, thanks so much. This is Rick Dooley from Health First and also Thomas Chinon Health Center uh, in Williston. And I wonder if you could just comment on, you know, my experience with Vital Access has been, um, granted it hasn't been this year, but in years past has been quite difficult. Um, you know, when the first rollout was rough, it was the consent issue was, you know, as you acknowledged, was you know, difficult at best. Um, you know, the data wasn't great. It, it just wasn't terribly useful. And there was a point where, you um, there was significant talk about trying to really integrate the individual EHRs for each practice um, with this data so that it wouldn't be a separate sort of standalone app or something you had to go to, but uh, would rather people, providers would be able to pull it up, you know, right within their chart um, and save that extra step, which I think would go a huge way towards uh, improving implementation. Is there still a focus on doing that or is this still considered a sort of standalone, standalone access? I can take that one, Maureen. Please. Um, it, it's definitely still a focus. Um, we currently have a project in flight right now where we are we are connected to eHealth Exchange. Um, in the past, that's one of the national networks. And in the past, that has been kind of a, you had to make each connection all at one at a time. They've switched their model um, so that the eHealth Exchange connection is now going to be a, a hub, so to speak, where it will be very easy to add new connections. Um, and we're in the process of, of testing that right now. So that will allow us to connect to not only eHealth Exchange, but potentially the Commonwealth Network and the Care Quality Network. And that's a much easier way of integrating into EMRs because most of the major EMR vendors are connected to one of those three national networks. The other aspect that will allow easier connections directly that is coming with our new collaborative services platform will be the ability to do fire or fast healthcare interoperability resources uh, interfaces in the future. Those are APIs or advanced programming interfaces, um, they, they allow the communication to be much more seamless. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in that front, um, but I would also urge you, if you have not been into Vital Access, our current provider portal in a while, to take a look. Um, there's a lot more data in there since the consent policy has switched in March. So, um, Great, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely take a look. I know definitely from an EHR perspective, um, you know, being able to view data is great. Being able to import it directly into your own EHR um, really is is invaluable because that's what you know allows the data to be mined in your local system. So anything that allows the importation of that data into you know local EHRs is is um, ideal. But thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And that seems to be one of the, the most common themes we hear from providers around the state. Um, you know, docs are uh, really frustrated when they have to have three different screens uh, going at the same time. And anything that can be done that uh, would coordinate everything together, it, it just makes sense. So, Amen. Other comments?
from the public? Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank the uh, team at Vital. As always, uh, we learn a great deal from your presentations. And uh, on behalf of all Vermonters, I really want to uh, thank you for the way you stepped up during the pandemic and especially during um, the UVM um, cybersecurity um, issues that arose. And um, Vital has really uh, done some amazing things this past year, and we thank you for that. Thank you for having us today. Thanks. So we're going to transition to the next uh, item on our agenda, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Mike Barber for um, a discussion on a rule change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Michael Barber, General Counsel for the Board, and uh, it's more of an update. Um, on on a rulemaking project. Um, as you know, the ACO oversight rule, rule five, governs ACO certification, ACO budget review, uh, as well as ACO monitoring and reporting. And kind of the background is for this project is when we drafted the rule, um, ACO regulation was uh, new to the board. Uh, we had issued standards as part of the multi-payer uh, shared savings program that preceded the all-payer model, but we had not, you know, reviewed ACO budgets or certified ACOs. And, you know, after several years of administering these processes, uh, it, it has become clear that some changes need to be made to the rule to update it. Um, a good example is that we were all wildly optimistic about the budget review timeline um, and as a result the dates in the rule uh, regarding when we'll issue the budget guidance when the aco will submit their budget and when we will issue our our budget order need need to be changed and there, there are things like that throughout the rule um, that we've identified over the years and we have been working uh, for some time on a potential revision to address issues like that um, for a couple reasons that work has not resulted in something that was complete enough to move forward um, and then during the fy21 aco budget process uh, you know you, you guys had a discussion about um, variable executive uh, compensation at acos and asked me to try and incorporate um, something into the rule around that and asked me to report back to you uh, towards the end of January on um, progress on the, on the project. So, um, so since that time, I, I've been working on this as I can. Um, and the update is that I'm probably, I would say, two weeks away from having a, a final draft that would be ready to share with stakeholders um, and so my plan would be if you're okay with it to um, to finalize the draft in the next two weeks and then send that to the office of the healthcare advocate uh, the aco uh, ask for feedback from them um, make any edits uh, that are necessary as a result of that feedback and then present uh, a final draft to you guys probably about a month from now or so uh, would be would be the timeline. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have, but um, just wanted to give you an update on where things stood and what the next steps were um, because you had asked for it. Okay, questions or comments from the board? Since it's just an update, Mike, I don't really need to go to public comment, do I? Um, I don't think so. Um, 
Well, I'll throw throw it open to the public just in case somebody has uh, anything to say. Is there any public comment on the update that uh, General Counsel Barber just gave us on the uh, progress being made on the Rule 5 change? Hearing none, I think that uh, people are going to get a good chunk of their afternoon back. This meeting has went uh, much faster than uh, anticipated. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Yep. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.